Okay, so hi everyone. Uh, welcome to today's webinar, the Lunch and Learn with Email Marketing Experts. Um, so hi, I'm Tom Rickards. Uh, I'm the Account Director here at Fresh Relevance. Um, it's my job to, to make sure that uh, all of my clients are getting the most out of the platform from a strategic perspective. Um, I've been with the company for just over three years now, um, but actually worked with it for a, a lot longer than that in a, a previous role too. Um, and yeah, with me today, uh, I am joined by Kate from eFocus Marketing. Hi everyone, I'm Kate Barrett, the founder of eFocus Marketing, and we help companies to use email more intelligently. And I'm really excited to be here for the Lunch and Learn today. And uh, also with us today is Gavin from Dot Digital. Hi everyone. Um, yeah, Gavin from Dot Digital. Um, God, I, th I think I've been in the industry for far too long now. Um, even though I know I don't, I don't look it, but uh, <laughs> essentially, uh, I'm email geek as, as as the others are here today. So uh, yeah, I love to, to to help people get the best out of their um, their platforms, you know, .digital, um, and make sure they're um, they're making the most impact with their their email marketing. Perfect. Thanks, guys. So our uh, agenda for today, to start with, I'm going to be talking to you about how to create personalized emails at scale. Um, I'm then going to hand over to Gavin to go over four quick wins to email personalization. Um, and then Kate will go next uh, on how to encourage loyalty through your email marketing. Um, and then there will be time for a, a live Q&A at the end of the session as well. Um, so within the platform, there's a, a chat and a question section. Um, so do please uh, feel free to, to go through and use that as, uh, as the session is going on. Um, and we'll do our best to, to answer as many as possible um, at the end of everything. Um, and you know, anything that we don't have time, uh, time to answer, then um, hopefully we'll be able to follow up with emails as well. Um, cool. So I will get things started then. So I'm going to be talking about creating personalized emails at scale. Um, now, just before I jump into the, the actual webinar content, I want to give just a, a really quick overview of who we are and um, you know what we do for, for those of you that don't already know. So Fresh Relevance, we're a comprehensive real-time personalization platform. Um, we can be used to collect customer data, analyze it, and then personalize with it, a uh, full real-time personalization platform. Um, we help digital marketers achieve their ultimate goal of boosting customer loyalty and revenue by creating an optimized journey across all the different channels and devices they might be using. Um, so the platform gathers data wherever customers go and it brings it all together in one place with existing data showing real time behavior and insight combined with the power to, to actually then act on it. Um, so some of our product features include cross-channel personalization, uh, dynamic images, product recommendations, data capture, uh, popovers, um, triggered emails, geotargeting, social proof, <laughs> the list goes on. Um, but obviously email personalization is the, the key thing that uh, I'm here to talk to you about today. And um, here you can see some of our, our lovely clients as well. Um, so we're mostly based in uh, online e-commerce, um, a big chunk of our client base in the retail and travel sectors. Uh, but we do also have um, a fair few publishers, insurance providers, recruitment companies too. Um, so yeah, uh, obviously if, uh, if that fits, um, fits yourselves, then do please uh, feel free to get in touch afterwards if you're not already using us. Um, so to start with then, why are you actually here and listening to me today? <laughs> um, I think to answer this, it's important to start with the reason that we actually exist in relation to the topic of the day, uh, scaling your email personalization. Um, so the average office worker has 651 unread emails in their inbox, apparently. Um, that's a lot of noise to cut through. Uh, so today's consumers expect a personalized one-to-one -one experience in a crowded digital landscape where your competitors are you know, a mere mouse click away. Uh, first, first name personalization in your marketing um, alone isn't going to cut it. Um, so yeah, keeping up with the, the savvy modern day consumer can be a struggle. Um, with the bar for customer experience and service rising each year, uh, marketers are facing new levels of expectation from their customers. So you can see here, 70% of brands say that personalized emails deliver six times higher transaction rates, um, but still fail to actually use them. 
um, which you know seems crazy when people know that but aren't doing it. And I think um, maybe a part of that is almost the the fear of it takes too long to set up or um, it's too complicated. Hopefully, I can show you that, that that's not the case. So personally, I find that pictures are much better at telling a story. So the next 20 minutes will be really packed full of different visual examples. I've got a, a fair bit of content to get through, so hopefully I'm on time. Um, and yeah, theory is uh, is great. Um, but who's actually you know, executing that theory well in the real world? I'm going to try and show you. So firstly, data capture should be a key part of your email marketing strategy. Um, you know, you can have the best emails in the world, but that's no good if you don't have anyone to actually send them to. Um, and let's face it, during a recession, you can't afford to spend a large chunk of your budget on acquisition marketing. Uh, you need to have a strong base of prospects that you can inexpensively and effectively market to. Um, and in order to actually reach these prospects, you need their email address. Uh, so that's why a smart acquisition strategy is really critical. Um, you know, having well-timed popovers that you can customize quickly can reduce the website bounce rate and it can incentivize customers to share their email address with you. So with their email address and technology to see what they're doing on your site, like Fresh Relevance, um, you can engage consumers much more effectively and efficiently. Uh, but you shouldn't adopt a, a one size fits all popover approach. Um, brands can use their website visitors, behavioral and transactional data to trigger personalized communication to the right person in the right place at the right time with the right message. Um, so just before I dive into um, some examples, here's how to make sure that your popovers are actually as engaging as possible. Um, so firstly, timing. Uh, no one likes to be interrupted. A popover that seems to appear for no apparent reason could cause potential customers to leave your website. Um, and that's very much where behavioral popovers come in. Um, next is context. So the best way to get the timing right is to serve popovers in response to browsers behavior. Um, you know, work out whether to use a popover um, and what content to include. You should consider the shopper's interests, their lifecycle stage, uh, the place in the buying journey. Um, and then think about content. So don't let design be an afterthought. Uh, a great popover makes your brand look professional and trustworthy. And then to maximize engagement, include a really compelling call to action and clearly show the value that you're offering to, um, you know, don't put shoppers off by asking for too much information. Once you have their email address, you can then get to know them better and follow up with, um, with further information. It's that getting that email in the first step that's the crucial thing. Um, and then finally, test, 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 test. Uh, ensure your popovers are doing a good job by continually testing and optimizing. So try out different timing, placement and content um, to find out what works actually best for your customers. Um, and yeah, with those thoughts in mind, uh, let's look at some great examples of um, actual popover targeting. So Killstar are a clothing and lifestyle brand with, as they say themselves, a twist of darkness. Um, and they've got this really eye-catching coffin-shaped popover. Um, you know, it might not be to everyone's taste, but it, it really stood out for me uh, because I've not seen too many brands actually taking this level of imagery. Um, and to be honest, I was a bit of a grunger in my youth, so it's, uh, it also appeals to me on a personal level. <laughs> but it's definitely just a, a really kind of compelling, eye-catching example. Um, which, yeah, I think definitely kind of stands out and almost kind of compels you to, to join and be you know, part of that gang, if you like. Um, Feel Good Contacts, they do an awesome job of changing popovers based on their customer profile and their lifecycle stage. So, for example, uh, new customers are presented with a popover offering 10% off of their first purchase. Um, whereas returning customers are maybe reminded of um, the offer that they haven't retrieved it, um, or they're then shown a different offer to download the app to receive a different incentive if they order that way next time. So you can see here at the, the bottom left hand, when you click on that 10% off first order, the pop-up then expands out, but it's what we call a, a consistent sign-up form. Um, so that is always there, you know, as you carry on your shopping, if you decide to start with, I don't want that offer, unlike an um, you know, intrusive style popover that jumps up in your face the second that you land there. If you dismiss that, you've lost that offer. This one, you can call back at a point that's actually convenient for you. 
Um, and also ever the bargain hunters, students are encouraged to use the company's larger student discount too. Um, so on the bottom left, you can see the popover has changed. So they're not seeing the 10% off now. Um, they've got the, the relevant discount for students um, as they've detected that the user has landed on the website from uh, a .ac.uk email address, um, or it's come from a studentbeans.com domain. Um, and then if that is not the case, when someone goes to the student specific landing page, the offer is also displayed there. Um, so these combined with a, a really nice exit intent popover as well, actually led to over a 300% increase in signups for them. Um, so yeah, definitely a, a good example of, um, of someone using data capture well. So I'm now gonna talk about uh, dynamic images based on context. So delight your customers with dynamic email content that's always up to date. Uh, with dynamic content, you can automatically generate compelling creative that is unique, relevant, and up to date. And the instant a shopper actually interacts with your marketing. So by adapting emails to each shopper's behavior, context, and preferences, you can personalize the entire experience. So firstly, location-based content. Um, you know, you can actually connect your clicks with bricks and encourage shoppers to visit the store closest to them by displaying things like uh, store details, maps, opening hours. Um, if the nearest store is too far away, you could set a rule to direct them to uh, the website instead, for example, with different banners. Um, you know, don't waste precious marketing real estate by displaying a product, uh, event or a job that's too actually far away from the customer. Um, you can filter that content and recommendations based on the location and interests of a customer uh, or the location of products. The individual will only see products that are available near them and likely to meet their interest based on past purchases and browsers. So Halfords in this example, um, they update the hero image based on if it's sunny or raining where you are uh, when you open up the email. Um, and the weather forecast there as well uh, is actually based on the user's location, which is a, a really nice touch. Um, and then quite similarly, uh, I really love this Lloyd's Pharmacy example. So they're using a countdown timer, um, which actually counts down to the uh, click and collect next day pickup, uh, the cutoff point. So that actually helps kind of create that bit of urgency to, to drive the conversion. Um, they're using product recommendations uh, in addition to social proof um, to actually show you, you know, these are popular products. Uh, 5,000 people have bought them recently. 2,000 people have bought them. Um, but my favorite bit in this is the leaf the bugs behind banner, which, you know, to look at, uh, you wouldn't really particularly think that there's much kind of targeting going on there. Um, but it's actually defined by the weather and where you are um, and what time of year it is as well. So they've got different versions for these uh, set up, you know, if it's springtime, then, um, you know, maybe there's more colds around in the winter. Uh, if it's um, hay fever season, you know, there's different medication based upon what time of year it is and what the weather is like where you are. Um, and they see really nice results off the back of it, too. Um, so it's a, a really good example. Uh, Wet and Wild use a piece of script to include dynamic delivery thresholds. And this encourages the shopper to buy additional items to qualify for free delivery and therefore helps increase overall average order value too. So you might want to think about setting different thresholds for when this could be shown. Um, for example, if it's 100 pounds for free delivery and you've only got five pounds of items in your baskets, then you know spend another 95 pound to qualify might not have the same effect. Um, so always uh, include a you've qualified banner for free delivery as well. Um, so when someone's actually over that threshold, you're not showing them a, a zero value. Um, and actually delivery prices often come up as one of the main reasons that people abandon their carts. So this could be a, a really key one to bring some of those extra shoppers back. Now, Thornton's use a countdown timer to encourage customers to make their purchases before their half price offer expires. Countdown timers are an effective tool to build excitement and urgency, especially for big events on the food calendar, such as Christmas obviously coming up. Um, Thornton's dynamic countdown timer draws shoppers' attention to the offer, uh, increasing urgency and decreasing click to purchase, 
as customers know that they have a limited amount of time for this. So then this example from Viovet shows category based recommendation in the personal pick section of the template. Um, so with our intuitive drag and drop user interface, you can also customize not only the messaging that the individual or a granular customer segment sees, but the type of content that they actually see in the first place too. So um, a different piece of dynamic content can be shown depending on a shopper's place in the buying journey, the life cycle stage, the preferences, um, location and weather I spoke about a moment ago, the time of day or a combination of any or all of these. Um, this one in particular is a, a great example as well with the personal picks. They're using the um, social proof for the, the recently bought. You know, these are popular products, um, but they're combining that with the product ratings as well, which is um, through a, an integration that we've set up with their ratings provider, um, which again, just kind of helps add in that uh, sort of trust of the crowd um, to, to kind of help, um, you know, these are good products and people like them. So I should probably buy them too. Uh, the, the sheep effect, if you like. Um, and then, yeah, product recommendations themselves, uh, offering them, you know, product recommendations, it's a, a tactic as old as retail itself. Um, but uh, a key way to provide personalized and highly relevant messaging to your customers. So showing relevant product recommendations can actually improve conversions by 11.2% as well. Um, now, timeouts are um, obviously known worldwide. Uh, they sell different time limited offers for, for nights out and fun things to do in um, 108 cities around the world. Uh, I don't know if anyone's been to their, their market. Uh, there's one in Lisbon and a, a couple of others around as well. Um, but yeah, they're, they're using our recommendations um, that render the customer opens, uh, sorry, render when the customer opens their email. Um, so no one would actually be disappointed with an offer, um, you know, if that's no longer available. Um, and they're actually based on, you know, firstly, the area that that recipient lives or is visiting, um, as well as what they've actually bought recently or engaged with recently. So if you've been looking at, um, you know, theatre trips in London, um, then that's the, the offers that you're going to see or, you know, likewise, food and drink, meals out, nice restaurant offers instead. Um, then another really nice example of product recommendations, which is uh, quite a recent one, was um, Vape Store. Uh, so it's a really nice newsletter where they're specifically promoting a particular brand, uh, Roofless, obviously, you can see here. Um, but the recommendations are actually specific to what flavor preference that the individual is most likely to, uh, to prefer. Um, obviously, if you know it's to someone who hasn't yet got a flavor preference, then it will just kind of fall back to the, the crowdsourced. These are the most popular. Um, and the other nice thing is you can see the recommended kits for you as well. So that's um, a further recommendation block in addition to the main kind of content of the message, um, which really is just trying to, to achieve some kind of further upsells. You know, these liquids aren't right for you. Maybe you need a kit instead, or you know, maybe you want a kit to go with those liquids and you're actually trying to, to upgrade the, the previous kit that you had. Um, and yeah, this this diamond store one, uh, I really love this email. Um, so higher price jewelry like theirs, it's not often a spontaneous purchase. Um, you know, speaking to them, I know that uh, obviously people and from personal experience too, um, people spend a, a long time before they part of that sort of money. If it's something like a, an engagement ring, for example. Um, so by implementing product recommendations within their browse abandoned strategy, uh, they actually guide customers to other products that they might like based on what they've already browsed. Um, it's really simple, but it's really effective um, and it's very appropriate with their company mission, which is, you know, luxury with confidence. Um, and we've actually recently published a case study for these guys too. Um, so with these particular product recommendations, they've seen a, an 11% sales uplift. Um, and also some, you know, some really impressive stats across uh, triggers um, and web personalization and data capture too. So um, definitely have a look at that. Um, and then, yeah, the sunglasses shop example is a nice one too. So they use uh, recommended products. You can see these are the, the ones recommended for you. Um, they've also got star ratings in there, I think, but it's quite uh, quite small. Um, but yeah, in addition to the, um, the recommendations themselves, they're showing the live Instagram feed within the emails too. Um, so using user generated content can see a 73% increase in click through rates. Um, so again, is well worth thinking about uh, actually including in those campaigns of yours. 
Um, and then the next area that I want to talk about is triggered emails. Um, you know, it's a really proven way to increase conversion rates and timely and relevant messages based on customer behavior. Um, you can build a comprehensive strategy with these that spans the whole customer lifecycle from re-engaging and reconverting website visitors to um, post-purchase too. Um, and yeah, let's face it, you know, most of you probably have them set up, um, but if you don't, then you're definitely missing out. Uh, on average, 57% of customers abandon carts, um, but for some sites that can actually be a whole lot higher. Um, so it's really important that you benchmark your current email marketing. So these can then provide you with some um, you know, really powerful performance indicators for, for what's a, an appropriate number for you. Um, and obviously what you can do to, to try and pull back some of those, you know, almost 60% of people. Um, so Mark Wynn's beauty brands, um, they're one of the largest independent cosmetics companies in the USA. Um, their brands include Lorac and Black Radiance. You can see here uh, Physicians Formula um, and a fair few others as well, I believe. Um, and yeah, what I like about this cart abandonment email is that I received it firstly moments after abandoning a product on their website. Um, frequency is really important. You know, you've got a very small window of opportunity to get a customer back to the website. Um, so make sure that it's really important that, um, so it is really important that you make the most of it. Um, it's also really important to maximize click-through opportunities and the buttons in this example are, are really prominent. So, you know, help reduce that fat finger syndrome, which um, we've definitely all been caught out with, uh, you know, accidentally clicking on something that you didn't mean to, you don't get frustrated. Um, simple things like that can, can make a really big difference as well. Um, they're also using the uh, dynamic delivery rule that I was talking about earlier too. Um, and then another abandonment campaign I'd like to draw your attention to is by Z and Co. So for those that don't know them, um, they offer hundreds of different exquisite clothing brands uh, via their shops and online. Um, and a key thing to note here is the messaging around Black Friday. Uh, you know, it's really important to keep triggered emails up to date with the most relevant and timely information. So once you've set up the cart abandonment emails, it's really simple to edit them. Um, and for a lot of retailers, Black Friday is a huge event, um, you know, obviously very fast approaching as well. Um, so adapting your messaging to reflect this is a tip that you should all be taking into consideration um, if you aren't already doing so. Um, you know, updating banners is a, a really simple thing that you can be doing as well. Um, you know, whether it's adding a, a kind of black banner in here as they've done or, you know, kind of Christmasing up your content as well, um, sticking in a, a Christmas tree or some snowflakes or whatever it might be. Um, it's a, a subtle thing, but it does have a big impact. Um, and then they also take their personalization to another level with their subject lines too. So they started off with just name personalization included in there. Um, but then they did some testing on actually including the brands that people have been um, been browsing or been carting uh, within the subject lines themselves too. Um, and the, the results from that were actually far greater. Um, so maybe that's kind of a case of people have toned out of name personalization in subject lines, but actually this is the product that I'm interested in. I'm going to come back and, uh, and buy that because you've sent me this well-timed reminder. Um, that seemed to be more successful for them. Is that another message? <laughs> I haven't dropped out again, have I? Oh no, something about questions. No, we can still hear you. Sorry, are we distracting Sorry. you? Yeah, no, I was just panicking that I've been lost at that point again. Sorry. <laughs> I I'd stop as I changed the slide. <laughs> Create more editing work for you, Laura. Cool. So abandonment emails in general should be automatically personalized with details of the browsed or carted products to remind shoppers what they're looking at. Um, and then to go a step further, you can personalize the banner image to match the brand or category of the abandoned products. Um, and then this will obviously help you get the, the shopper's attention right away. So I really like how Pet Drugs Online use um, the name actually within the banner in their emails, um, which is in addition to uh, you know, displaying the dog because I've been looking at dog food or the cat if it's cat food, horse if it's horse food, whatever. Um, they don't just do food as well. <laughs> um, but yeah, the, the imagery combined with the name personalization uh, really helps to make this one stand out, I think.
Um, and then here's a, a nice example from Flashpack. So Flashpack offer boutique group adventures for solo travelers in their 30s and 40s who really want to get under the skin of a place via local and unique experiences. Uh, so as you can see in this example here, the browse abandonment email offers a get inspired section in the template. Um, travel companies in general are in a unique position in that they have an abundance of data at their disposal. Uh, so using different data sources such as their destinations, the dates, the budget, the products browsed, um, it really helps empower companies such as Flashpack to build robust and highly relevant triggered emails um, to actually increase that sales uplift that you can see there. Uh, customer reviews, really valuable to online retailers for well, a whole number of reasons. Um, but firstly, reaching out for reviews allows you to keep in touch with your customers and potentially set up another purchase as they return back to the site. And then once you've collected the customer reviews, you can obviously add them in real time to your emails and your web pages. Um, you know, ratings and reviews are a really powerful form of social proof, and um, they also really help you know boost your SEO on your website as well. Um, and I think I mentioned previously, just kind of help add that kind of trust in your brand. Um, so definitely taking the, the opportunity to follow up there is a is a really kind of key example of a purchase follow up message. Um, and then the final triggered email that I'd like to touch upon today is the price drop trigger. Um, so price drop emails alert a customer when a product that they've browsed has actually dropped in price, you know, it does what it says on the tin. Um, but these emails not only recover sales, but they boost loyalty um, and they provide customers with actually quite a helpful service as well. Um, so price drop alerts inform shoppers of discounts to the products outside of a formal sale. Um, obviously that they've been looking at previously. Uh, a triggered email lets everyone who has shown interest in that product know that it's now got cheaper. Um, so they work similar to other triggered emails. In terms of results, we kind of typically say it should be similar to a, a kind of browse abandon type campaign. Um, and for shoppers who've obviously opted into your email marketing, their browse data is captured and stored. So when something does drop a price in your e-commerce system, the alert's just triggered automatically. You know, you don't need to, to do anything to, to set them up and send them out. Um, and then obviously, crucially, details of the item themselves browsed, including the images, uh, are inserted into the email to make the offer more compelling. So you don't need to do any manual configuration. Uh, the emails are sent by the ESP, so dot .digital in this example. Um, and that gives you, you know, full control of the, the creative element of the message. Um, and yeah, Country Attire have a, a really nice example of this as well. Um, I've done a few kind of tests around, do you want to include uh, other recommendations within price drop campaigns as well? Uh, the jury's not quite out on that one from um, from tests that I've done. So that's definitely one to, to think about for yourselves. You know, maybe start off with, this is just the product that has dropped in price, come back and buy it. And then include in a, a recommendation as they've done here um, to see if, you know, if this now isn't something that you're interested in anymore, maybe this is and they come back and buy that instead. I forgot about the animation on that one. Um, so yeah, some takeaway action points for you here then. Um, so utilize real time data, provide rev uh, relevant content. Um, you know, it's cliched, but data really is king. Uh, the more that you know about someone, the more that you can personalize that message to them uh, to ultimately actually make the content that you're showing to someone relevant and engaging for them. Um, and that then, of course, helps create a smoother experience overall, uh, which then hopefully should lead to more sales. Um, and then, yeah, finally, keep testing. You know, the biggest mistake that people make is setting something up, uh, leaving it running um, just as it is for ages. You know, it could be that it's getting good results, but actually a little tweak here or there um, you know, could actually further optimize things to, to generate far greater rewards, too. Um, and then, yeah, last thing from me, just before I hand over, um, if you would like to download a copy of our latest shopping report, uh, which is on what the new normal will look like for Black Friday and Christmas this year, then please do. And the, the link is there on your screens. Um, and yeah, that's it from me. So I'm now going to hand over to Gavin. Excellent. Thanks, Tom. Um, some uh, really great examples there. Um... So let me let me share my screen now. Choose the screen to share. Excellent. There we go. Perfect. 
Right. So um, let's get uh, let's get into this. So I'm talking about personalization and, and Tom sort of touched on a couple of bits there, but hopefully I sort of elaborate on that a little bit more. But these are some quick wins that you can do um, pretty quickly, really, um, <laughs> surprisingly, uh, to get up and running with your, your personalization. Uh, before getting into anything, I don't want to pitch at you, so don't worry about this at all. All I want to say is that we um, we partner with Fresh uh, on a number of different projects, and um, we ourselves, Dot Digital, are home to over 4,000 clients in 150 countries plus worldwide, um, and we help them reach their goals faster through omnichannel marketing automation because essentially uh, speed and ease of use at the core of our platform. Now, that's all I want to say about that, because really, I want to get into relevancy. You know, the modern day consumer is far more in tune uh, with just how valuable um, they are to you and what you can offer them in return. You know, if you want to make an impact, you need to be more relevant. And personalization is the key to that. In fact, 75% of marketers recognize that using personalization tactics in email result in higher click-through rates um, and a significant increase in ROI. But why is it that people aren't using it? You know, there's not enough people using it. So I think in order to answer that, we have to look at this question, you know, what is personalization? What is it exactly? Well, personalizing emails means leveraging your customer data uh, to target specific subscribers with your campaigns. Um, and we can personalize with a number of things. The list is endless, you know, from, from name, first name, last name, date of birth, job title, et cetera, et cetera. The list really does go on. It's sort of the sky is the limit with your data. But what you need to do really is make sure that your messages are timely and relevant. A relevant message um, will make your marketing stand out from the inbox. And I think Tom said it already, there's 651 unread messages in an average person's inbox. So it's got to be timely. Um, uh, sorry, it's got to be relevant and then timely as well. By offering the reader relevant content, your email has a better chance of making impact. But then to make things more impactful, you need to reach um, customers at the right stage in their, their journey with you. And that's essential. And that means it needs to be timely. And, you know, that, that timely stuff really does help. And these two things together make a difference. So I want to go through a couple of things, really, the, the four things that you should be doing to, to get you uh, off and running. First off is making sure your data is right, so the collection and you know, preference centers. Then we'll look into segmentation, then some different forms of personalization, and finally, testing. I know that's one thing that uh, Tom mentioned, but is that there's a theme here, and you know, the best marketers always test. Right, so there are two main arguments um, that people use to justify the lack of uh, personalization. First one is they say, you know, building personalized emails takes time and we don't have that time. Um, and secondly, they say we don't have the right data to personalize relevant emails. Well, the, the answer I'd give to both of those things is you need to make time and you need to go out and find the right data to make, uh, make these things impactful. You just there's no two ways about it. You have to make yourself time. And it might be a little bit of time up front, you know, that you're taking away from your other tasks throughout, throughout the day. But once you get these things set up, it will make it a lot easier for you to keep going. 80% um, of customers are more likely to purchase from a brand who provides personalized experiences. And that just makes sense. Customers are happy to hand over their data if they were receiving, you know, personalized, unique experiences in return. So go out there and look at your touch points and make sure you're making the most of the opportunities you have out there to collect that data, whether that's online or offline. Oh, offline. Do you remember when we used to be able to you know, meet people in the street and, you know, go to uh, go to um, uh, events and whatnot? You know, those sorts of things. But even if you haven't got offline anymore, just think of the other channels and bits and pieces you can use um, and, and maximize those those opportunities. So we've got things like this, uh, a data capture form. And this one from um, Foot Asylum is a good one. It's not the best, but I can use it to, to make an example here. Because essentially what you're trying to do is collect as much information as possible, but not be uh, creepy. You want to be useful. So they've got a title there, which may or may not be use, uh, useful. Last name, first name, as I mentioned before, but then they've got date of birth. The great thing about this is then you can start to personalize, you know, um, birthday messages. 
after that they've got the shoe size because they want to be able to personalize again on the, the stock that they have and make sure they've got the right um, sizes for you but after this you've got this blank space and it's not to say that you have to fill it but you could fill it so the option is here that they may ask what brand you're into more often nike if anyone wants to send me free free shoes um but you know that is something also you could use to help personalize the message to an individual which is what home depot have done here they've got loads and loads of options they're asking for to make sure they're making the uh the message that they're sending out to people as personal as possible but word of word of caution here don't collect too much information that you might not use down the line if you're not going to use it don't collect it don't waste people's time and um, but you can always get this uh, this information further down the line for example in the post purchase you can always ask people you know how things were after the purchase you know get them to um, score things get to uh, get them to write reviews all of this information can be used later to personalize your content Next up, segmentation. You know, it's key here to personalizing um, your, your messages. 51% um, of marketers consider list segmentation to be the most effective tactic for effective email marketing. It's great. You know, it helps you to um, put your, your data into different pods so visually you can see what you're going to do. Because if you can see that there aren't too many people that fit this bracket, then maybe you're personalizing for, for you know, the wrong reasons. But look at your data um, in, in these buckets and then it will give you a great visual representation. But segmentation alone isn't perfect. You really do need to quickly um, ramp up and get um, personalizing as well, which means you have to fuse these two things together. I call them the sort of the digital marketing twins because they really do need to go together. You know, the more and more you personalize, the more you should be segmenting as well to understand your data. And there's great ways of understanding your data and helping you to personalize and segment by using things like uh, RFM data. Um, or RFM um, uh, analysis, you know, using your frequency, monetary, um, and, and recency um, to understand exactly where people are on their journey with you and to choose what channels to, to message them on. So this is a really great way of, of, of enhancing your data and getting all of the, uh, the I guess, the, the goodness out of it, really. So personalization and segmentation is key. Next up, I want to look at different types of personalization. You know, for me, there's like basic, intermediate and advanced, and we'll go through those. But essentially, you just want to be um, using a mix of these things. And nothing's basic if it's working for you. Nothing's advanced if it's working for you. But I, I've sort of put these things out here so you can see and, and use whichever one you want to. First up, basic. I mean, obviously, everyone wants to start here, but you can start doing things like uh, moving into the inbox and using um, using the subject line, for example. When an email lands in the inbox, you know, subject line is probably the first thing that people notice. You know, most um, most uh, tools that you use will will help you make the uh, subject line a little bit more eye catching. You know, a heavier font on a, on a light background, uh, for example, unless you're using dark mode or something and then it's flipped round. But using that um, um, subject line to help personalize and grab people's attention. In some cases, you can have a boost of up to 14% by using um, uh, uh, personalization in the subject line. Another thing you might want to do is to look at these icons that um, you've got here in the inbox, um, and that is a Bimmy icon. You can get your company logo in there, which will help you personalize your message a little bit more and jump off the, fa uh, the page a little bit. Um, Bimmy is something great uh, and helps you uh, sort of, uh, if you've got good, send the reputation as well. And uh, at Dot Digital, we can help you do that with a couple of steps. So if you are a Dot Digital user, you can reach out to your account manager for this. But once you're into the inbox, and that's what a subject line hopefully uh, allows you to do, you can start to personalize away. There's some very basic uh, tactics here, dropping in people's first names, uh, and this example on the right from Monica Vivanda actually takes a person's um, uh, initial, the first, uh, first uh, letter of their, their name, and drops it into an image. Really subtle here, but it can have a massive impact. Next up, we're sort of looking into intermediate. And this is ways of like eking your data out to sort of display it um, perfectly in a campaign to make it all about them. 
We've seen loads of examples of this type of thing. Um, Fitbit on their birthday, you get a breakdown of you know how many steps you've taken. I don't know if I want to be reminded of that on my birthday, but there you go, each to their own. Um, Spotify also give you a breakdown of your of the year of music you've been listening to. Um, this is great, um, and I look forward to every time Spotify uh, sent this sort of message to me because it's all the data about me. You know, and being selfish, you want to know about yourself. And this is a really great technique to make it all about the individual. And it's not just uh, uh, in B2C world. B2B, you can do it too. You just have to pick out the right data point and execute this um, beautifully within the campaign. <clears throat> Another great example of this, and I always show it all the time, is this one from EasyJet. You know, using all the data you have about this individual and putting it directly into a campaign to talk about where they flew to first, where they should fly to next with a, a recommendation that's personalized, and also talking about the fact that they like to sit in the window seat more. All of this data is about the individual, and it comes together beautifully to create <coughs> this campaign. Next up is advanced. <clears throat> now, essentially, what you want to be doing is is having personalized, real time imagery, you know, product recommendations, and also different channels as well. <clears throat> product recommendations uh, based on the you know the the journey and the history of people moving around your site is brilliant. It helps you create a really hyper relevant um, experience for the individual. <clears throat> and as I choke here, I'm just going to have a quick sip of water. Sorry. Ah, oh, there we go. And if, you, if you're not using these tactics, you really should be thinking about it. It really um, helps to take your message to the next step. <clears throat> so you can start doing product recommendations like this, everything from bestsellers all the way through to lookalikes. All of this information helps to um, raise the bar for your campaigns and make them hyper-personalized. And this is what makes it advanced. So all of these messages here, this one uh, from the left-hand side from list, is all about what people have been browsing and then giving recommendations on everything that they've just looked at. So this whole campaign is built up of recommendations. It's personalized to the individual. This next one here on the right-hand side from Feel Unique is all about the product that this person uh, purchased and the fact that they may be running out. What's more personal than that? You know, they're sending this message at the right time to this individual because um, they may have run out of stock um, or run out of their, their product. And they can get, get the opportunity to repurchase this, reorder this. At the bottom as well, they've got an example of other products that they may be interested in. But to make this even more personalized, they're saying, well, did we get this wrong? Because if we've got this wrong, here's an opportunity for you to tell us when to send this, um, this email back out to you. And then, again, the message is even more personalized. If you want to continue that sort of vein of personalization, then you can look at um, using different channels as well. So email is always going to be our bread and butter here at Dot Digital, but using different channels as well helps you to personalize the message and make sure you're hitting people with the right message at the right time, but also on that right channel. Right, uh, next up and, and finally from me is to be testing. Um, Tom mentioned it earlier, and as I said, there's a bit of a, a theme here, um, but you need to ask yourself, will this work? Well, the only way of understanding that is by testing things out. Remember, failure and learning from your mistakes is always part of this. It's required to expand and grow your email strategy. Don't be afraid to try out new things and to fail. No one wants to fail, um, but that's why we test. You, you basically need to weave in testing into the fabric of your company. You know, set up controlled environments to figure out what's going to work for you. Uh, testing done the right way means that you shouldn't really fail. Well, I guess not so much that you, you might lose a job, but that's exactly the way you need to go. So just a quick summary from me, and then I'll, I'll pass over to Kate. Um, first off, as I said, you need to make sure you're getting your data right. Make sure you're collecting the data and looking at all the different touch points so you can get the right information to power your campaigns, and then you can segment. And then you can look at different um, types of personalization, you know, from basic um, subject line personalization all the way through to using product recommendations uh, and changing content on the fly for people. But always be testing. Make sure you test things out, make sure they work for you. And if they're not, change things up a little bit and keep going. Thank you. So uh, so now I think uh, I can pass over to Kate. Um, so bear with me. 
Uh, if I can stop sharing my screen, there we go. And Perfect. Thanks, Gav. Hopefully everyone can see my screen and hear me okay. It's an absolute pleasure to be here today and to share with you some of my thoughts on how you can encourage loyalty through your email marketing. So you've heard all about personalization, but how can we use that in specific areas to help us meet our objectives? And one way is to work on engaging loyalty with your email subscribers. So I'm Kate Barrett. I'm the founder of eFocus Marketing, as we mentioned earlier. And over the last 14 or so years, I've worked with a whole range of brands looking at campaigns from welcoming people into your email program to your loyalty, your experience, and making sure they come back and keep buying from you. I'm also the author of the book, Intelligence, Email Marketing Isn't Dead, The Way You're Using It Is, which I'm delighted to tell you is a bestseller as well. So why is loyalty important? Well, there are a couple of reasons that I really wanted to pull out and highlight for you today. The first, we've probably all heard this one before, is that it can cost five times more to attract a new customer than it does to retain an existing one. So we need to make sure that when we're spending that money to get new customers in, we're making the most of those and improving their customer lifetime value through our email marketing campaigns. The other is the increasing customer retention rates by just 5% can increase your profits by 25 to 95%, depending on what you're selling and how much money is being brought in on those average order values. So bringing customers back in, getting them to buy from you again can have a massive impact on increasing your revenue and your profits. And most timely for me is the fact that COVID-19 has made consumers a lot more open to changing the people that they're shopping with. They've had to come out of their shells, so to speak, even though we're not allowed outside, or not allowed to shop anyway. They've had to kind of come out and really decide, how can I get those products that I need and want in a different way when I can't physically go in store? What are the options that are open to me? And of course, in the other way round, those shops that aren't able to open on the high street anymore have certainly put a lot more effort into that online offering. So the number of options available to consumers has increased as well. So we've got to think about how we can use all of this to our advantage. How can we really communicate with our customers and prospects to keep them coming back to us? And of course, we can do that across multiple different channels. But email is the most effective digital marketing tactic for retaining customers. And that's because email marketing has a profound impact across all of the stages of the life cycle. Whereas other channels kind of come in and come out at different stages and certainly have their benefits at each. And we should be thinking about that omni-channel strategy Email is your foundation. It's your baseline. It's your direct communication channel through to those customers to get them to come back. And that is around the entire email marketing lifecycle. So let's have a look specifically about how email fits into this. So in the acquisition stage, when a potential customer first becomes aware of your brand, You've got your list growth strategy, how you're reaching out to those touch points to get in front of potential subscribers, potential customers. And you've got your sign up forms on your website. You've got your email sign up as part of your purchase process. Moving into consideration where they become aware of their need or want for the product or service that you offer. And they start thinking about those options that are available. Would it work for them? What are the alternatives? What are the pricing alternatives? They're asking a lot of questions at this stage. And you've got to deliver campaigns that drive them around to say, yes, you are the provider that I want to buy from and get them through to that purchase and experience phase. So you'll do this a lot with your newsletters, your sales emails, your behavioral triggered campaigns that we've seen some great examples of with the abandoned baskets, the abandoned browse, those types of emails. And when you can push them through to that purchase, you've got to make sure that they don't just go through that purchase with you. 
but that you build an experience with your brand. This is where a lot of companies fall down. They'll deliver those standard post-purchase emails where they confirm the order, but they don't go above and beyond on that. And I've got some examples for you to help inspire you in a minute. And then, of course, once somebody's bought from you, we need to try and get them coming back again, actively engaging with you and your brand. So those are your specific loyalty campaigns, your push to get them through to purchase that next product. And then inevitably, some customers, some subscribers may go inactive with your brand, inactive with engaging with your email marketing campaigns, and you want to try and re-engage those. And unlike some other channels, as I said, email fits into that customer life cycle at every stage. But for these purposes, let's focus in on two stages in particular, the purchase and experience stage and the engagement and loyalty stage. Now, as you can see from the screen, there's a lot of information on here, I know, but stick with me because these are just some examples of the types of campaigns you could have at each of these stages. And I'm going to go into a little bit more detail and give you some examples of those. So when you're thinking about that purchase and experience phase, think about what those customers need from you. So 89% of companies see customer experience as a key factor in driving customer loyalty and retention. So everything that you've seen today, all of those amazing personalization techniques, using the data that you have to understand who you're talking to, when you need to them, so identifying that data that puts them into this purchase phase and then the experience after making a purchase, of course, and then delivering that relevant content. So let me give you some examples of how you could do that. The first is really to think about how you can go above and beyond. And this is a great example of an ordinary product confirmation email, order confirmation email. But in this email, you can see that this is expanded on what you would usually see on those basics. They give you a map of where the product is being delivered to. They confirm that address as they usually would, but the map really stands out and brings it to life. I love that they include these clear sections in the email to confirm what you bought, what to do about missed deliveries, how to get in touch with them, they understand the needs of the customer within that email and the key questions that might come up for them. So here we are looking at how we can extend that content above what they would expect. Another product recommendations example, you've seen some earlier. So this one again is in the product confirmation email, showing just some additional items that they might want to buy. When they're in that buying frame of mind, upsell, cross-sell, it's a great time to get in there and add to what they've already bought from you. Because the experience that they have with you is everything. And if you want to stand out in a crowded marketplace, online, in the inbox, you've got to come up with content that doesn't just sell, but it nurtures. Whether you are in B2C or B2B, the same thing goes. Just replace these examples with what you're selling. Now, if it's a service, how can you lead them through step by step how to get the most out of that service, how to log in and find different areas of their account, how to get the most out of the product that they've just bought? Think about how you can step into those customers' shoes. What do they need from you? More importantly, what do they want from you? Speak to your company. Find out what those frequently asked questions are about specific products, services that you offer. How can you build this into your content? And could you even go one step further? And if you've got the technology, this is a great example where somebody has checked out, put their items in the basket, and then received an email to say, hey, you know, your order hasn't been shipped yet. Shipped yet. Do you want to chuck more items in, toss more items in? So allowing you, even before that's left the door, to actually add more to the current order, not even go on to buy another order, increase that order value right now. And as I mentioned, if think about if you've got a service, and this is a great example on your screen now, take them through step by step. This one does it in a timeline. 
show them how they can get the most out of what it is that they bought from you, be it be product or service. Think outside the box. And also think about how you can make that purchase and experience phase so amazing that it makes this next stage even easier. If they've had a great experience with you and you've backed that up through your email communications, through the other touch points that you have with them, how can you pull them back in? Now, the probability of selling to an existing customer is 60 to 70 percent. Selling to a new prospect is 5 to 20 percent. So yet again, we're seeing the value of the people already on your database. Make the most out of them. Understand them. Because existing customers are 50% more likely to try new products and they spend 31% more when compared to new customers. So again, it allows you that opportunity in your business to get them in to try those new products, to upsell, to cross-sell, to come back. So the aim is to really keep them engaged and encourage that repeat purchase. But if you set the groundwork in the purchase stage, this is gonna be a lot easier. So this stage really sees those first time customers going on to make a second purchase, second purchase customers going on to make a third, onto a fourth. Where are those weaknesses in that selling cycle that you have? Analyze your data. Is it first to second, second to third, third to fourth purchase? Where do you break down? Fill that slot with an email campaign. Give that strength to the communication that you have with those customers. Get them to become advocates for your brand. Share their purchases with family and friends or on social media. It really is about hitting them at the right time for them. And this is the perfect example of that from Ancaster Nissan. So my car was due for a service and they pushed that straight through to me, reminding me based on my car, the specific date it was needed, information about what I needed to do to get my car there for the service and what I needed to bring with me. Everything that I would have needed to inform me to book and go and actually get that service done. Very clever email. And think about those other data points that you've got. So whether that's an anniversary of them joining your site or their first purchase, perhaps it's their birthday and you want to send them out something that's going to get them to come back and buy again. Perhaps it's like the examples we've seen from Gavin, where you're reiterating data that's important to them, showing them how they have got the most out of your product or service. Perhaps it's inspiration. Perhaps it's content that's relevant to what they've looked at before, what they've shown interest in. Perhaps it's other relevant pr products. Perhaps it's information that's going to help them to get to the next stage in the journey with you and lead them to a higher value package, high value products, increase that order value and increase that advocacy. So think about those two key stages. And when you do, I want you to think about getting, ex getting started in three key areas to help you do this. So the first is identify who falls into those two categories. So thinking about your purchase and experience stage and your loyalty stage and ongoing engagement with your brand. How do you identify them? What data have you got? Purchase data, behavioral data, known data that you've asked people for. What have you got that you can bring in to identify where they're at and who they are? Because if you can then dig down into that data, RFM analysis, like Gav mentioned as well, if you can think about what are the different types of people who are in these stages? Have they purchased from us once versus purchased from us every single week? Identify those different types of people within that audience so that you can start to personalize even more throughout these campaigns and plan them out. Plan what you want to do from a manual point of view, whether that's having some dynamic content in your standard newsletters or sales emails that directly talks to people who've bought from you before versus those in the consideration stage who've never bought from you before. Their needs are slightly different. So you can personalize some of those manual emails with dynamic content there too. Or automated campaigns that specifically target them at each of those stages. And we gave you some examples of those earlier. 
And of course, as we've mentioned already, don't forget that your customers aren't just your subscribers. Think about that omni-channel experience and have multiple touch points where appropriate to bring in those other channels to strengthen the messaging in the way that they work best. But email will always be your foundation. So that's it from me. Make sure you go above and beyond in your emails to inspire loyalty. So I think now we're going to jump into our Q&A session. So let me stop sharing my screen. And I think we're all coming back on for the Q&A. OK, thanks for that, guys. Yeah, really, really great presentations from both of you. Um, and yeah, thanks a lot for, for joining in. Hopefully everyone's finished their lunch now and um, we've just got time for a, a couple of questions. Um, so firstly, uh, one that's come through here. Um, how can I integrate other channels in creating these loyalty campaigns? Uh, Kate, do you want to take that one? Yeah, absolutely. So it's about thinking which of those channels are going to be most effective at each stage. So, for example, using social media retargeting ads, if somebody's abandoned their basket or if you want to encourage them through to make another purchase, showing them those products that would be relevant to the category that they bought before, for example. It's a great way to integrate it, but you've still got your email campaigns that are going around that. So it's starting to force and bolster the message. Using SMS as a reminder. So you might have an email that goes out. You've got your social media ads that are running. Email, SMS, another email to follow that up. So think about the channels that your audience are using and how you can use them to their best advantage to meet the objectives of that life cycle stage. Perfect. Thanks a lot. Um, I like this one. At what point does personalization become creepy? Uh, Gavin, do you want to have a go on that? Um, yeah, I, I, I love this one. Um, <clears throat> I think it's 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 when you overstep the line, and uh, this this is a, a bit of a moral question, I think, as well. Well, the answer is going to be a moral one. Um, always talk about being open, honest, and transparent, but also you've got to look at whether or not you would like this sort of message coming to you. Um, <clears throat> if you think you're overstepping the line and you're being you're being too intrusive um, with what um, with what you're saying, um, then you're be probably becoming too creepy. Or if um, if um, you're collecting way too much information that is actually relevant to making the the email useful to the individual, then you're becoming too creepy. I think um, everyone's getting carried away with collecting so much information when really you should be thinking about how is this data going to make the campaign more relevant, more useful to the individual? Um, if you're worried about that, then you're probably crossing the line. You're too creepy. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, it's one we uh, I get asked a lot as well, actually, um, particularly with kind of browse abandon campaigns. Mm -hmm. um, so people, it, I think it totally varies, like you say, depending on um, you know, what, what your company is, who your customers are. Um, yeah you know, uh, a kind of electronics retailer that we work with actually are very obvious and say, you know, we noticed you were looking at these products. Are you interested? Yeah. Um, but then, you know, conversely, I work with Ann Summers, you have to be very careful about, you know, what they're targeting and and who they're talking to, to which products about. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, definitely kind of bear, bear your audience in mind uh, at all times exactly. as well throughout that. Also comes down to the content and the how you, the copy as well, because the copy can say the same thing in different ways if you're if you're smart about it so uh yeah um making sure you, you you've got a good copywriter i think as well absolutely um i'm guessing this is one for me uh i just use you for emails at the moment can i do data capture too um yes <laughs> is the, the short answer <laughs> on that um so the way our platform works is you're split into different modules um, so if you just have the email personalization or potentially the triggers module as well, um, then the short answer would be no. Uh, you would either need the, the data capture module or the web module um, to, to look at using popovers and, uh, and different forms of data capture with us. Um, but if you're already using us, that's definitely something that either I or one of the other account managers will be more than happy to talk to you about. Um, I think we're actually out of time. Um, so there are a couple of other questions here that we'll follow up with um, via email. 
Um, but yeah, thanks again, everyone. Thank you, Kate and Gavin, for, for both joining us. And no um, thank you, everyone, for, for listening in as well. Hopefully it's uh, been a nice lunch break for you. Um, and yeah, look forward to, to seeing you all again. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.